Parrish, how are you? Hi, Yvonne, how are you? We're good, thank you. Can you hear me? I can. Great, thank you. I'm a bit worried about all of this. This is all new, so it's new for you and, and, and for me, so it's a, always a learning lesson no matter what we're doing, so great to see you. Um, so, hello everyone. Um, I'm so honoured that you've all uh, joined myself and Dr Karen Phelps. Uh, it is an honour for each and every one of you to have joined us. Um, my name is Yvonne Weldon. I am a Wiradjuri woman from Cowra here in New South Wales. I'm from the waters of the Clare, which is also known as the Lachlan, and of the Murrumbidgee Rivers. I'd like to pay my respects to all Elders past and present, to all First Nations, to you, and the many ancestors' lands that you're on today. I humbly pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Ora Nation, who are the First Nations that suffered the first impact on behalf of all Aboriginal nations across this continent. And I would like to pay my respects to the people of the lands that you're on, whose spirits and ancestors will always remain with these lands, our Mother Earth. Joined with me here this afternoon is Dr Karen Phelps, Karen is Australia's best known doctor for me. Certainly I have uh, been in awe of her in the difference that she's made to the lives of so many. Uh, Karen has, um, has certainly had a major impact in health communications and with uh, public health advocates. A true pioneer in the fields of health communication and integrated medicine. She has been a GP for more than 30 years. And in 1985, started working in health communication, bringing messages about a healthy lifestyle to the attention of the general public. Karen was the president of the Australian Medical Association and is a councillor of the City of Sydney. As we continue under lockdown and much of our COVID is still quite confusing, um, and I'm so grateful that Karen has joined us live here today to be able to address some of these myths, but certainly address some of the issues that you would like to have addressed by asking your questions. We will endeavour to answer that all questions. Um, so if you put them in the chat, uh, we will respond when possible. So welcome, Karen, um, and thank you for joining me and joining all of us online here today. Um, and so if anyone would like to um, post some questions, please do so, and we'll, we'll like, get to them hopefully if we don't run out of time. So to kick off the session, um, Karen, the first question that I do have is, uh, do you think this lockdown will end in September? Uh, the question everyone wants to know the answer to, everyone. First of all, let me say thank you for that uh, welcome to country. Uh, it's always uh, such a gracious to welcome, welcome to country from you. And I'm speaking to you from Durrawal country um, at the moment to the south of Sydney. Um, and I pay my respects to elders past and present and emerging uh, in this area and also in the area from, from where you're speaking, which is um, Gadigal, Gadigal country. Uh, now, about the lockdown. We all want the lockdown to end as soon as possible. We all want to get back to seeing our friends and our families. We want our businesses to be back in operation again. We want jobs to be preserved. We all want our normal lives as we knew them once, to be returned. The big question is how soon can we get back to that? Is September the date? It's really hard to say. It depends on a number of things. Now, we have seen uh, states, Victoria and New South Wales, get back to zero COVID in the community before. I believe we can do it again. There are many people who are sceptical about that, but what it's going to take is a concerted community effort to make sure that everybody plays their part and not everybody sees, um, you know, what they can kind of get away with. Now, it is difficult to get your head around all of the restrictions that are being recommended, but I have to say that the restrictions that are being recommended are being recommended for a reason. And the reason is because this virus jumps from one person to the next as the only way it can survive. The only way it can continue to cause infections is to be transmitted somehow from one person to the next. So if we limit the ability of that virus to jump from one person to the next, sooner or later it won't be able to do that. Now, we had zero COVID uh, before, back in prior to June, and we, we know that just one contact 
just one contact was enough to spread it to a few other people. And they all spread it to more, and now we're faced with, you know, mid 400s of cases per day in New South Wales at the moment. And Victoria has its own struggles. The ACT is in lockdown as well. Uh, so this is a long answer to a question about will we be out of lockdown? But the short answer is that depends. It really depends on how uh, we proceed. And, and vaccination is one pathway, but it's not. It's not going to get us there. It's not going to get us to herd immunity. Yeah. So in terms of um, if we can't get there, what what are we aiming towards in terms of the magic number? Um, what magic number do we have to hit in order to end the lockdown, do you think? A lot of people are hanging out for a particular number in terms of the percentage of people in the community as this is going to be the time when we can all go back to normal life. It's not going to be like that. And I'll tell you why. Uh, in order to reach herd immunity with Delta, that's not going to happen at 80% of eligible adults vaccinated. First of all, even if you are double vaccinated, it will prevent you in the vast majority of cases from becoming very sick with this virus or dying. So it's a protection for the person who is vaccinated. In terms of reducing transmission so that you are less dangerous to other people if you have the virus, it can achieve that too. But it doesn't mean that you can't get the virus and it doesn't mean that you can't transmit the virus. So even people double, double vaccinated can still transmit the virus. So then we have this whole other area of problem and that is the people who can't or won't be vaccinated. Now for the people who can't be vaccinated, they may have very strong medical reasons why they can't. And if they can't be vaccinated, then they are in a vulnerable group if they come across this, vaccine, this virus. The second issue is that at this stage, we don't have any vaccines that are recommended and approved for children under the age of 12. We've got a supply issue for the 12 years to 18 years, and certainly from 12 years to 60 at the moment for the Pfizer vaccine, we've got a supply issue for the Pfizer vaccine but we don't have any approved vaccines for children under 12. And so if you open up at, say, 70% or 80% or even 90% of the population vaccinated, uh, that's only talking about eligible Australians. That's only talking about people who have been approved for vaccination so far, which is people over 12. So it means that you've got the people over 12 who can't be vaccinated, who can't get the supply of the vaccine, but you've also, even if all of those people had the supply, we still have children not protected. And what we do know about Delta is that it does affect children more than previous strains. Yeah. So while we're on that, you know, while we're just discussing the, the differences or certainly the impacts of the vaccines, can you actually talk about the difference between the vaccines that are available at the moment? The difference <laughs> between the Yes, yeah, sure. The, the vaccines that we have available at the moment in Australia are the AstraZeneca vaccine and the so-called Pfizer vaccine, which is the, the, the names of the pharmaceutical companies that produce them. Uh, the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine is technology that we've seen before. It's basically using a chimpanzee adenovirus as a way of carrying uh, the spike protein into the body um, and then the body reacts to that spike protein and that's, the spike protein is, is a part of the COVID virus that can't cause infection. But the body recognises that part of the virus and mounts an immune reaction to it. So that if it comes across the COVID-19 again, say if somebody coughs on you or you somehow come across that virus, your body goes, I recognise that as part of that virus and it mounts an immune reaction to it. So that's how it protects you from severe disease because your body recognises it and has already, you know, kick-started an immune reaction to it. So that's the first one. That's the AstraZeneca. The Pfizer vaccine is what we call an mRNA or messenger RNA vaccine. Now, uh, messenger RNA is um, a sequence of substances that send a message to the cell, which is why it's called messenger RNA. And the message that it sends is for the cell to produce the spike protein, which then 
in the same way the body reacts to and sets up um, a reaction to it. Now, uh, those, those are the two different technologies and uh, you're basically getting to the same point with the immune system but using two different types of technology. The Moderna vaccine is also an mRNA vaccine or a messenger RNA vaccine which will be coming to Australia, we presume, sometime before the end of the year. Right. Thank you. So in terms of um, pregnant women, is it safe for them to have the COVID vaccine? Well, anyone who is planning a pregnancy or who is pregnant will understand how very protective a pregnant woman will feel about her, her developing baby and not wanting for there to be anything that you do or anything that you put into your body that is going to hurt that child. What we know is that COVID, the virus, if you get the virus, it has a, a greater effect of making the woman sick and of what we call an adverse outcome for the pregnancy, so problematic for the pregnancy, if you get the virus. And so the Royal Australian College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists and ATAGI are both recommending that women at any stage of pregnancy have the vaccine. One of the problems, and they are now a priority group, one of the problems is for women who are planning pregnancy, who want to have the vaccines before they become pregnant, are not yet a priority group. And so, I mean, this, this has been one of the problems all the way along with lack of supply, is that we're having to pick and choose who are the people, who are priority groups to get the vaccine. If we had enough supply for everyone, we wouldn't be facing this problem. Then it would be mainly an issue of logistics of being able to get and enough people vaccinated in time to protect as many people as quickly as possible. But the question you specifically ask about pregnant women is that uh, it is recommended for women who are pregnant by our college uh, that, that uh, looks at all the evidence of safety and efficacy uh, of vaccines and other interventions for pregnant women and also for TARGI, which is the expert group that's uh, making, give, giving advice to the government and to the medical profession. Thank you. So there's a couple of questions that have come in and I'll just see if I can try and uh, join them together. Um, in terms of if you're under 40, should you take the AstraZeneca? And what are the risks associated with AstraZeneca vaccine for the general public uh, with people with pre-existing medical conditions, so people with low platelet levels and, and, and the like? So um, sort of double-edged really about but really about AstraZeneca is it safe if you're under 40 and then if you um if you are not um what about people that actually have pre-existing medical conditions as well well anybody with a pre-existing medical condition of any sort needs to speak to their GP who knows their medical condition and can talk through any concerns and certainly uh, as a GP, I've been having many, many of these conversations with people based on their specific concerns. Now, let's say, for example, someone has asthma or diabetes or heart disease, then we would be encouraging those people to get protected because they would be more likely uh, to develop complications from the virus. Uh, and, and certainly there, this was recognised very early on in the rollout with people with chronic medical conditions that were quite well defined. Uh, being recommended for early vaccination. Uh, when it came down to a choice of which vaccine to have for which age, age group, this has shifted around and that has actually caused quite a lot of concern. And the reason is this, that early on in the vaccination program, uh, it was recognised that there was a rare clotting condition. It's been given a number of different names. But basically, it involves uh, clotting with low platelets. And, uh, and that this tended to happen with the AstraZeneca vaccine in younger people. Now, uh, as, as the evidence came through, as millions of people had this vaccine, uh, the recommendation from the expert panel said that if there are no circulating um, cases of virus in the community, then the risk of getting the, the virus is lower than the risk of having the vaccine. And so what they said was, have a Pfizer vaccine. That wasn't available for people under a particular age. And the age actually shifted so that it became, well, if you're over 60, you get the AstraZeneca. If you're under 60, you get the Pfizer. But then the landscape changed. And what changed was that we then had an outbreak of Delta variant. 
So that completely changed the whole situation so that people were then having to make a decision about the very real risk of contracting coronavirus against the risk of a rare complication of clotting with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Of course, there are uh, complications uh, potentially with any vaccine. And even uh, with the Pfizer vaccine, there is uh, a, an unusual rare complication of pericarditis or myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart or inflammation around the heart, which seems to be more common in, uh, in young males. And so, you know, it, it's a matter of making a balanced decision about what the risk is in your community at a particular time and what vaccines are available. Now, we've had a situation also where Pfizer has not been available. And so we've had younger people saying, well, look, you know, I'm prepared to take the risk of this rare clotting situation, but I, I, I feel that that's a much lesser risk than the risk that if I went out into the community unvaccinated, then I could get um, the COVID vaccine, the COVID virus. And so the risk of the virus became greater than the risk of the vaccine. So it's a matter of balancing risks and benefits. Yeah, great, thank you. So if someone's actually had their first AstraZeneca vaccine, why is it important that they get the second uh, dose and can they get the Pfizer vaccine as their second dose instead? Okay, uh, both really good questions. Uh, there is a certain level of protection that you get with your first dose of the vaccine and, and that's kind of an, uh, an initial awakening of the immune system to create a protection against the virus if you come across the virus. You then, having the immune system primed, there's a second phase. So when you have the second dose, it increases the likelihood that your immune system will be able to cope with the virus and to... Um, uh, if you like, to neutralise the virus if you come across it. So you get much greater protection after the second dose of AstraZeneca than you do with the first. And you get you get a greater first reaction with the Pfizer and, and you then get an uplift with the second dose of Pfizer as well. Uh, in terms of mixing the doses, that is being done overseas. Uh, it's being done where uh, it, it's been necessary because of uh, supply, but also where somebody, has, for example, has had an AstraZeneca first and then Pfizer second, and, uh, and that's been shown to be very effective as well. It's not being done here in Australia at the moment, but I do suspect that down the track, if our expert panel recommends that it's safe based on international experience that they will recommend that we have um, some mixed dosing schedules uh, and, and we have to just work out which of those mixed dosing, dosing schedules of different types of vaccine are safe and whether there are any um, potential downsides to, that, to doing that. At this stage, it looks like it could be quite safe and effective, but we have to wait and see. Yeah. So... The wait and see, and in, in, in terms of the information and how you know, how it responds. With that said, like, um, will we? Need, do you think um, is it likely that we will need booster shots? Do you, uh, booster shots are all important. There are some countries in the world who are already doing booster shots, and they're doing that because in uh, where, where there are populations with high levels of vaccine. Uh, uptake and uh, and where there is a Delta variant or a new emerging variant, they're finding that they need to do booster vaccines to um, to increase the protection for people. And also at this stage, because it's early days, we don't know how long the, the antibody response is going to last you know, in the human body. And particularly uh, if the virus mutates or changes over time and you get different variants emerging, they're most likely going to have to tweak the vaccine to make sure that um, people are able to respond to emerging variants. So I do think it's likely that we will see booster shots uh, needed in the future, but uh, I think that's one of those, let's, have, let's wait and see what happens and let's see what the expert panel recommends as time goes by. Thanks, Karen. So tell me, um, I mean, it, I think some of the confusion and certainly, you know, the the messages that have varied over time from last year to this year, you know, and to present day times, you know, um, what the Delta variation difference of the earlier version of COVID to present day, like, I mean, kids were going to school and, 
you know, they were they were saying that, you know, initially we had this hard lockdown and there was all of these approaches and then now people are going, well, the approaches didn't matter then. But, you know, and so there's, I think, you know, like with the spread, I mean, clearly it's a lot more, um, you know, contagious and easier to spread and it's impacting children now. But, I mean, apart from that, what parts of the Delta variant is different to the first, to the first one? Well, it never made sense to me that children couldn't get the virus and that they weren't going to be transmitting the virus and therefore schools were open and schools could be safe. Because apart from the fact that the obvious fact that you have teachers there and school administration staff and cleaning staff and librarians and you know parents coming and going and there was you know enormous amount of mixing of of people, it just didn't make sense that children couldn't transmit a human virus. Uh, what has become evident over time is that the Delta variant is more highly transmissible and it does affect children. And one of the concerns about children not being able to be vaccinated is that if we do have everybody going back to school while we still have high rates of transmission, then we are placing vulnerable children at risk of this virus. And we do know that this virus can and does make children very sick and can kill them. And so the decisions that are made by our public health officials going forward must include children. And, and Peter Doe himself spoke about this on Twitter during the week. He said that, you know, we can't be making political decisions about what happens with uh, lockdowns and, and opening up and schools and without considering uh, children in that equation. It's so important that we do. And, and you know, it's always surprised me also even while, while the schools were open, were open and I mean they're still open, but while we're, whilst they're still uh, having uh, children being being homeschooled at the moment, and, and with a mixture of some children having to go to school if they're children of essential workers, why teachers weren't prioritised in that first group of frontline health uh, frontline workers? Um, but but hopefully hopefully we will get around to vaccinating all school staff so that, you know, before children go back to school, whenever that might be, that, uh, the, the, at least the teachers will be pr pr protected. And I, th I think also the other thing too is that we had, we had months and months and months last year of debates about whether masks work or not and whether we should have people in masks. Now, it was just so obvious it was a respiratory pathogen, a respiratory virus that you could catch by either being coughed or sneezed on or breathing in the air around somebody who had the virus. And yet there was all this focus on wiping down surfaces and cleaning down, you, you know, your shopping and washing your hands, but there was no focus on wearing a mask, which was such an obvious uh, source of protection uh, for yourself and for others. And I think we have to have going forward as we move towards planning as early a relief of the lockdown as possible, that we get more people out and about in masks um, so that we are able to move about more freely when the time is right and when it's safe for us to do so. So in, in terms of um, playgrounds for kids, I mean, Melbourne has closed its playground. Should Sydney follow the, that same route? Well, I think if we're serious about reducing uh, transmission and particularly uh, between children and then back to their families, that we have to have a period of time, I think, where playgrounds where a lot of children who are going to be in very close proximity with each other are closed um, for a period of time. Uh, children are still going to need to go and run around for a period of the day, but maybe they can go kick a ball in an open field rather than all be on top of slippery dips and swings and things because I think that that is... You know, apart from the fact that, you know, children can sort of, you know, sneeze and rub their hands across their noses or, you know, you yeah. know how it goes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they certainly spread them, don't they? They certainly share I, I, them. You know, it's, 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 there's no way that you can protect children going into playground if there are people who are in the playground who are carrying the coronavirus. So I think it's just we have to be thinking about this and parents have to just make sure that they try and keep their children as, as safe as possible during this time. I think we have to close the play, playgrounds for now and uh, I think we just probably have to, to wait and see whether the New South Wales government uh, make, makes that makes that recommendation hopefully soon. Well, I'm going to be a little bit bold here, although we're going to be speaking you know, um, the questions about COVID, but I just, what just occurred to me, and certainly 
you know, you've been so instrumental uh, in terms of counsel um, and, and with your expertise, that, you know, and you are a doctor for crying out loud, but did the city last night discuss any of these issues around the council enclosing the, the uh, playgrounds at all and making sure that our, our children are safer and, and maybe draw upon your expertise um, in making sure that we are not spreading it for our, our children and, and certainly on the council's uh, city uh, playground areas at all? Look, I've, I've had um, a, a, an effective dialogue with the CEO of the council and senior staff over this time, and they, they have uh, spoken to me over time about things like uh, making sure that uh, all of our council uh, workers had masks supplied for them, for example, uh, advice on uh, which community, uh, on when community facilities had to be closed or opened. And so we have had those conversations behind the scenes. It didn't come up last night. Uh, in the council meeting about playgrounds, but I have sought uh, separate advice from New South Wales Health, and hopefully I'll have an answer on that in the next day or two. Great, thank you, Karen. So important with your leadership. Tell me, um, because there has been so much mixed messaging, and you know, in the past where you know we've already covered how young people, you know, were saying that it wasn't a problem, now it is a problem. Where is the safest place to be able to get? the right information and so people can make informed decisions, not just, you know, something that they've seen online, but real um, a clear advice um, so that, you know, families, individuals can make those informed decisions. Well, I think the first place is the, the uh, official government websites. You know, the, the website in your state from the State Health Department will give you advice on like exposure sites, uh, general advice on being COVID safe, advice on how to, to make sure you, that your business is COVID safe. Uh, so uh, that, that sort of advice is important. You can, if you're in New South Wales, you can service New South Wales and uh, and they have other than a couple of times actually get some clarification on some of the public health orders and, and they can be very helpful. You do have to hold for quite a long time to get an answer, but they are there to answer questions. Um, and, but I, th I think in terms of specific personal medical advice, your GP is uh, we are keeping all of the information. We're making sure that we keep up to date. Our college keeps us up to date. And so and your GP knows your health condition. And so I think it's important that you have some about your health conditions with your GP. Yeah, right. So... In terms of, I mean, and going to your GPs is an important part, but what about um, the homeless population in Sydney? Um, how can we better support them and, you know, and help them be vaccinated, do you think? Well, I think uh, uh, the homeless services are, are, will, will be reaching out to people who are homeless, and I, I think that's very important. The other important group, uh, which is going, going to be difficult to, to reach is the and asylum seeker population because they don't have access to Medicare. Mm. Arrangements um, will have to be made for that population. Uh, and, and I think um, for people who find it difficult to access health information generally and to understand what is, you know, as you can see, quite uh, a, a moving uh, scenario in terms of what vaccine, when, for whom and where do you get it, uh, I think it's been a great move that uh, GPs have been a part of this vaccine rollout, that vaccine hubs have been set up by the state government. I think it's fantastic that pharmacists have now come on board now that we know it's safe to give this vaccine in the community. And so the more places where people can uh, can literally walk in and be vaccinated or make a booking and be vaccinated, Better. So accessibility is really important. With that must come supply. And going forward, we need to think of a whole lot of other things that will keep us all safe. We need to look at the ventilation. We need to look at air purifying units in places like schools and offices so that, so that the, the, the air quality... These are things that haven't really uh, come to, to the front of people's minds up until now, you know, even in flu season, everyone in the office gets the flu. Well, I don't think we can just accept that anymore going forward, you know? So we have to say we can do all of these things better. 
we have to have purpose-built quarantine. You know, hotels were never supposed to be the answer to uh, keep the Australian population safe. They're not built for that. They haven't got the ventilation requirements. They haven't got um, the, the safeguards in place. Uh, Howard Springs up in the Northern Territory where some of our Olympic, that, Olympic athletes came back to quarantine. That's more of the sort of thing that we need where people can get outside, get some fresh air, be separated from other people. Windows are open um, and they're, they're away from urban centres. Those, those are where we need to be able to see people coming in and out of Australia. But I think it's going to be a long time to get before we're going to be able really move in and safely, even with vaccination rates. So with that said, like, do you think that if we had, you know, more people in workplaces that are vaccinated, do you, like, is there any evidence to suggest that it will become more safer and have a lower rate of transmission or we just don't know yet? We do know that there will be a lower rate of transmission, much lower rate of transmission, with people who are double vaccinated. And, and it's important to be double vaccinated for yourself, for your family, for the people who can't be vaccinated, and for the people who are not vaccinated for some reason, like, for example, for children. But we have to also remember that even vaccinated, you can still, no, it's less likely, but you can still transmit the virus. So wearing a mask, whenever you think you're going to be in with other people, that's going to be really important. And then there are all of these other public health things that we need to put in place too. And we need to be, to be looking at regulations at local government, state government, and at federal government level to make sure that we participate. And this is about what medical professionals call the precautionary principle, to anticipate where there might be problems and to put in place safeguards in anticipation or as a precaution before something happens. So, like, for example, at the beginning of this um, at the beginning of this outbreak, which was in June, and we, we, we knew what the Delta variant was. And you can't just think we can outsmart this virus. We've actually just got to be absolutely diligent and efficient and uh, cautious about how we approach uh, the public health measures around a virus like this. Because in the end, the faster we get on top of it, and we need to do that with quite strict measures, but the faster we get onto this, the faster we can get back to business, back to seeing our families, back to school, back to feeling safe in our community. Yeah. So with, with that point, um, Karen, like it, this lockdown seems to be a, a lot worse for a lot of people. Um, and certainly, you know, social, emotional wellbeing, like mental health, um, you know, has really uh, impacted, uh, you know, every every you know age group really. And um, can you share of any strategies for helping people to get through this? It is very hard, and particularly for people who live alone or who are not living in safe home arrangements. Very hard. Uh, to the extent that you can, I think it's important to reach out for those of you who are on. Instagram Live today, um, hello and good on you for, for joining up, uh, finding community where you can. Uh, we, we are keeping in touch with our family members by, uh, by FaceTime, uh, by, by, by setting up, uh, you know, co coffee with friends on, on FaceTime and we just, we make an appointment to actually, you know, sit down and catch up with them, find out what their news is, you know. Not much point asking people where they've been. They haven't been anywhere, <laughs> but just to sort of see how they're going, how their family's doing. Um, uh, if you're able to do to do work, to find meaningful work, or to to volunteer for groups, I think sort of reaching out to, to people who are in need is really important too. Spending time in nature is extremely important. Uh, if you can, find, you know, parkland, land nearby to home within the. Uh, regulations as they are at the moment that's so important um uh, and uh meditation is also important so you can find meditation apps uh, spend some time just um settling uh and, and finding some, some peaceful place uh, I, th I think if you are becoming very anxious uh the news about COVID, perhaps 
bit of digital detox for a few days here and there. And just, okay, maybe you have to know the numbers at 11 o'clock every day, but maybe you don't have to listen to the whole press listen to all of the news books all day, um, and, and then sort of catch, maybe catch up on it in, in a few days. It feels like it's overwhelming. A lot of people are turning to their pets, their household pets, at the concert during this time, and particularly uh, people who are, are living alone. Um, a, a pet can be a great companion, but remember if you do get a pet, uh, that that's a, a long term commitment for, for this lockdown. Uh, so that's important. Um, reading is great, listening to podcasts. So there are things that we can do, and I, I think we also need to um, practice some. Uh, gratitude for the good things that we do in our lives and uh, and I think that, that also helps when you're feeling uh, uh, sad about all the things that have been taken away from you uh, to maybe just slow down and just think about the things in your life that, that are, are good and, and give you happiness. Yeah, great. Thank you. Tell me, um, just uh, as we're getting towards the end of the questions, um, do you think that this is the last wave of COVID um, and will we be living with COVID forever? Australia has the advantage of being an island and so we are able to control our borders in a way that other countries are not able to. And so uh, we, we have been able to achieve zero COVID in the country before. Uh, Erin, you just cut me out a little bit there. Your internet was a little bit unstable. Could you just repeat that? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, that's much better. Thank you. Uh, We have been able to get to zero community transmission before. Uh, Mm -hmm. I believe that we can do it again. It's going to take a whole of community approach. Uh, I think it's really important that we take the the recommendation as seriously as possible. Uh, and, and look at how you can contribute to us getting to zero. Uh, there are a lot of people who are saying that they don't believe that we can get to zero, but I, I actually think that, that it is possible. What we also need to do in the interim is make sure that we build a team uh, because I think that the only way of us having long-term relief from lockdown, rolling lockdowns Victoria's in its sixth phase of lockdown at the moment, uh, is, is to have, you know, as close to zero transmission community as we can, and that's going to take a big part of community effort. Yeah. So um, just just before we close, and um, I mean, and if you want, would like to make up any other points, and that, you know, you're welcome to do that, please, um, if, if possible. But... Just from me, in terms of the last question that I have, is that is um, if there's anyone that's sitting on the fence um, to, and considering whether they do or they don't get the vaccine, um, what's your thoughts on this? Um, and you know, what's the message really for those that are online and, and perhaps those that may uh, watch this recording later um, and certainly get the clear messaging from yourself as a GP, but also as a person that has really provided a lot of advice uh, around health promotion and, and making a difference in the lives of so many. Uh, what's your advice to those that are, you know, really weighing up whether they should be vaccinated or not? Um, can you just give us some words of advice around that? I think it's important to recognise that COVID-19 is reality. It is uh, a dangerous virus is circulating in our community. Uh, There are things that each one of us as a community member can do to reduce the likelihood that you will get or that someone you love will somebody that you love could get the virus and get extremely sick. And so the best thing that we have in our uh, in our armament at the moment, that the best possible way of protecting ourselves and others at the moment is double vaccination. And, uh, you know, until we have a treatment and hopefully we will have effective treatments of verge over the next year or two. I mean, it's been remarkable for most of the medical miracles. Quickly, uh, scientists were able to develop vaccines. It just happened to happen that, you know, technology progressed to a point where uh, vaccines were able to be developed, you know, within six months of the original. It was really quite, 6 to 12 months. 
And so I think it's um, I think it's something that we can't just wait for there to be a treatment. We don't know how long that's going to take. It needs to be tested. It needs to be proven effective, to be safe. And in the meantime, the very best you can give yourself, your children, your parents, your friends, people who can't be vaccinated, is to have the vaccination you Oh, great. Thank you. Um, that's it from me. I don't know if you had anything that you would like to add, uh, Karen. I really appreciate um, all your advice and, and certainly um, your willingness to answer uh, the questions that have come through. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to, to add? No, thank you, Yvonne, and uh, I wish you all the best for the elections in December. And uh, you know, I think it would just be amazing to have you on the City of Sydney Council to, to provide your wisdom and expertise. And so I wish you and your team all the best. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and and, um, and for your advice and, and uh, your insights, really. It's such an important part for all of us. I mean, it's such a minefield out there. And I think, um, you know, you've certainly added so much more insights for each and every one of us that have listened uh, to you tonight around what are the key key messages but also the key decisions that we need to make to ensure that we can get out of this lockdown and certainly make everyone in our lives um, safer um, and certainly not spread uh, COVID or be subjected to, to receiving it as well. So um, I appreciate your time and, and all your support and it's always a great honour to be able to connect with you. So thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Eva. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.